Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. It is easy to give up hope and to crawl into a hiding place and hide from the world when we look out and see so many things that terrify us every week. I think the fact that we have news and social media and all these things in our face from all across the world, it makes it seem all the more devastating when we look out and see all of the terrible things that are reported each and every day. And it's a natural reaction for us to be terrified, to be scared and look at all of this senseless, pointless violence and think, where are you, Lord? What are you doing? Why don't you come and punish wickedness? Why do you let all of these terrible things happen? Why do you make me even watch it? Aren't you listening? We see so many reports these days about police shooting people. And we see reports about people shooting police. And we see more and more, it seems, racist attacks and anger between different groups in our cultures. We also see a country that is more and more opposed to common sense morality, I think we would call it. And those who oppose a popular opinion are hated more and more for those things. It seems more and more that we are living in a country that is very hostile to Christianity and religious belief or individual belief in general. And that can be pretty terrifying for us too. And we look at ISIS and we see mass extermination of Christians. We see attacks all around the world, all the time. And I'm pretty sure all of us have, at one point or another, wanted to shut it all out and hide. And you are in very good and large company doing that. Throughout the ages, people have cried out to God, and many people are terrified for their lives. Terrified by what they see around us. We hear the prophet's exact words this morning in our text, expressing the exact same fears that I'm sure have been on your hearts at many points in our today. Let's read the beginning of our text from Habakkuk chapter 1. How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen, or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Let it be in a small way comforting that you hear God's own prophet crying out the same anger and questions that are on your heart so often. It's not just you. But let this text be even more comforting as we continue today. And not only hearing these questions voiced in the Bible, but listening to God's direct answer to Habakkuk, his people, and to you, so that you can have hope each and every day of your life. To understand this, first let us look at Habakkuk and where he was in history. Why was he crying out like this? We probably think, well, as bad as it was in the past, today it's only gotten worse. So we have much more reason to cry out these things. And Habakkuk, it must not have been that bad. But let's look at where he was in history. Habakkuk was from the people of Israel around 600 B.C. So about 400 years after David. Now during David and Solomon's time, the people of Israel had a, the best kingdom during that time. That was the greatest Israel would ever be. And at that time, they cared about God, and they listened to His statutes. They had set up pretty good laws that made sense. 
and the government worked pretty well. They were a superpower of their area, so they could protect their own borders. Things felt safe. They cared about God. But not now. Not at Habakkuk's time. See, at Habakkuk's time, the people cared little about God. They had abandoned the one who had led them out of Egypt, who had brought them to this beautiful promised land, who had protected them against unbelievable odds, and now they rejected him altogether and didn't want to listen to any of his laws. If you would have looked at the people of Israel, you wouldn't have seen those who believed in a true God. You would have seen people that looked exactly like everyone else because they worshipped like them, they looked like them, and they scoffed at God like them. Habakkuk is crying out to God, not just about people out there, but he's crying out about his own people. He looks at his nation and he says, what has happened? The morality that we all kind of held together that we cared about, it's gone. They don't care about you anymore, Lord. They don't acknowledge that you helped get them here and you are the one who promises to protect them when they trust in you. They don't care. They think they can invent their own truth, their own reality, protect themselves and, and create a good life for themselves. In a verse after the section I just read, Habakkuk says, The law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. So not only is there this complete disregard for God, but Habakkuk says that no one cares about the law, that the courts are rigged, that they're broken, that justice never really happens. People come with their complaint and people laugh at them and consider it nothing. But at the same time, those who do love God still are put on trial and are hemmed in by the wicked. And they are punished by the law. And then there's also the great superpower that is surrounding Israel at that time too. Assyria was this great and powerful nation that had conquered everything around the people of Israel. And there was absolutely nothing Israel could do about it. They were weak, they were broken, and so terrorism was an absolute norm. They could come in and do raids and take their women and attack them, and there was absolutely nothing the Israelites could do. So Habakkuk cries out to the Lord, How long, O Lord, will you not listen? As we have all this internal problems, these people don't care about you, they put your people in prison, and we have all these nations around that can attack us, and there's absolutely nothing we can do about it. Lord, why do you make me watch all this violence? What are you going to do? Are you there? Do you care? How am I to live? Kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? What Habakkuk had going on in Israel's time? At one point, we thought of America as a pretty powerful and wonderful and friendly nation to Christians and that it cared about God and it gave him thanks, at least in a general way, that he was the one who had given us the beautiful privilege of forming this country and having all these rights and this security and we gave him credit for his protection, his love, and our good life. But can we really say that's the case anymore? Do you think our nation, at least in general, wants to, in any way, be associated with the God that you know? Not really. And some of those things, even with the justice being perverted, is part of the reason why our nation is so angry with itself and each other. Because we feel that justice isn't done. And whether it's true or not, that's the overall impression that justice is being perverted and I know even as Christians we feel that way a lot now when we are convicted and hated for beliefs that we are told to hold to by our God. Beliefs that we had a right to and now are hated for it. And even persecuted 
for what we believe, despite what our nation was founded on, that we may believe as free men. So in a lot of ways, a lot of our frustrations are very similar to what Habakkuk was crying out to God for. That our nation has abandoned God and justice is being perverted. And I would say that we are more and more frightened of the powers outside. That we are more insecure about our own safety with the immense powers that be outside of our own country. As we see many attacked and exterminated and nothing being done and powers outside of our nation growing and our power waning, we wonder, Lord, why are you sitting around? Are you listening? What are you going to do about this violence and destruction and hate and persecution that your faithful are enduring? And what are you going to do about all these people that mock you to your face and say that you don't exist, that they don't need you, that you didn't bless us with all the things that we have today? What are you going to do? Are you listening? History is repeating itself. No surprise there, if you've read history at all. Everything is uncertain. However... The beautiful thing about this section in Habakkuk's cry is that God answers it directly. He speaks directly to Habakkuk and his people, and in so doing, he speaks directly to us and responds to our question and our fears and our insecurity. And he answers us. Let's continue reading in our text. We look at God's answer as we jump to chapter 2, verse 1. Habakkuk says, I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. Then the Lord replied, Write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. See, the enemy is puffed up. His desires are not upright. But the righteous will live by faith. So, what is God saying? First to Habakkuk and then to us. He states first off that this is a very important message and that a herald should get ready to run with it, to spread it throughout the whole nation so that they can hear what the Lord has said and take comfort in Him. God answers the question of how long. They're wondering, when will this happen? When will this happen? When will you answer me? When will you punish the wicked? And God's response is, at the appointed time. So while many of the people of Israel have had to wait and watch for years for God to do something to protect them, to get justice. He says, at the appointed time, this will happen. And later on in this book, God lays out very specifically for Habakkuk exactly what that was going to look like. As I said, the powerhouse was Assyria at the time. But God says specifically, I will raise up the Babylonians who will come in and destroy the Assyrians. And at that time, Babyloni the Babylonians were nothing. But God says, I will raise them up, and they will destroy this nation, and they will punish them for all the wrongdoing they have done against you, my people. But don't think that's all they'll do. Babylon will come in and humble the people of God, the Israelites. He will humble those who have thought for so long that their hope was something that they could bring out from themselves, that they could invent truth on their own, that they could feel secure by their own might. I will come in and shock them with the power of the Babylonians, and they will be terrified. And they will remember that they cannot defend themselves, but that they need me. The righteous, at that appointed time when the Babylonians come, will continue to be okay, because they have always lived by faith. Let's stop a second on that last phrase. The righteous will live by faith. What does that mean? 
What was he saying to Habakkuk and his people? He's telling them two things. One, you will live by faith. That means that your entire life is a calling to trust in me and not in yourself. To trust that the all-powerful, the all-knowing, the all-loving God knows exactly what's going on in this world, even when it looks like chaos. And yes, for our vantage point, it does look like chaos and senseless violence and that God is losing. But from God's point of view, from His timetable, everything is going exactly according to plan. Think about what God has to deal with in this world. He deals with sin on a large scale that is infected because of our decisions, by the people's decisions that is infected where everyone, everyone's heart is intent on evil. That's not just the people out there, but your hearts. And you don't trust Him and often listen to His commands. So how is God supposed to get things done when even His own people don't listen to His own direction half the time? How does He still go in His direction? And yet, he still, in a beautiful way, is able to weave all our imperfect storylines with the evil of the world out there for your good. And all the people of Habakkuk's time would have had to do to remember why they could trust the Lord was look back at their history. How they had come out of Egypt. How God had made Abraham into this great nation. How he had led them and defeated Jericho by walking around it seven times and securing their borders and defeating with Gideon thousands of men with 300 people and trumpets. How does this happen? Because God is on their side. And he always rescues his people when they trust and rely on him and live by faith. His record is flawless. He overcomes all odds. So he says to his people, continue to live by faith, as I have called you. Continue to trust in me, the one who can see the good path before you. It's too hard for us to see it from our vantage point. The other thing God says when he says live by faith, the righteous will live by faith, is that they, no matter what happens, even if many perish in a war or or die, or, or are struggling in this life and have health problems, the righteous will live by faith still stands. Because what is true of Christians? Is this our time span from 0 to 70 years? Absolutely not. Or even 0 to 30 years, is this our time span? What do we believe as Christians? We live by faith. And that faith connects us to Jesus And Jesus connects us to eternal life. So when he says the righteous will live by faith, that means even if we die a little bit earlier than we were expecting, and many Christians do, that doesn't mean that God betrayed them or abandoned them. All it means is that they got to transition into the best place ever a little bit earlier. They are in heaven with the Lord forever. The righteous live by faith eternally. And what does God's answer say to you and me today? What is he trying to communicate to us? He declares to us the same truth that he proclaims to Habakkuk. We look at great powerful nations, we look at terrorism, we look at all these attacks and we think, God, when are you going to judge them? He says to us at the appointed time. Those who do evil and refuse to listen to him and spit in God's people's face and continue to reject him, will be punished, and there will be justice, and it will not be pretty. And God will do that at his appointed time. Even for the Babylonians who came in, who were not really a hero, but came in and did God's will, he punished the Babylonians too. And soon their nation came crumbling down. And the same thing has happened throughout all nations, throughout history. God uses even wickedness and evil men to accomplish his good for us. And he will do the same thing to ISIS and any other superpower, any individual who attacks and hurts his people. He will bring justice upon them. But he also waits for the appointed time because many of God's people, many in this country, many around the world need to remember who their God is. It's not them. It's not their own thinking. It's not the people around them or the community that we live in. It's not this world. It's God Almighty. 
And they need a wake-up call. They need to turn back and remember that they are not safe on their own, but they need God. So maybe, at an appointed time, God will bring some troubles here. More than we are currently going through. But why would He do that? What do we know about God? He uses it to bring us to our knees. Not so that He can squash us, but so that we are there before Him, begging for His mercy, and He gives us everlasting life when we come to Him. He gives us forgiveness. That's exactly why Jesus came. This is a sinful world filled with sinful people, including you and me. And He has to rescue us from ourselves because we contribute to what's going on out there. We contribute to our own problems in our lives because of our sin and our decisions. So God had to rescue us from this world, not to make this place perfect, but to call us out of it. And He does that through Jesus Christ who is God Himself, came into this world as the perfect human being, who fulfilled everything for us so that we could cling to Him and He could carry us by faith to new life, today and forever. God is not slow in keeping His promises. Second Peter shares that with us. He says, The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God is not not listening to you. He is not disregarding all the evil that happens here, but He is patient with you and His people. He wants us to turn back to Him. And for the righteous, what does He say? He says, the righteous will live by faith. You are to live by faith. That means you're not going to trust in the military. You're not going to trust in politicians. You're not going to trust in America or some other nation to save you. We have an extra hard time with this because, yes, we do have a vote. And, yes, we do have a part in our government. And that is awesome. But if for a second we put our trust in our nation or in a certain party or politicians and we think they will save us, it's part of the reason we're so terrified today about who's going to win this election. But let's take a step back and remember that we have never had control over everything that happens in this world or even in our nation. But God has always had control. And so no matter what the future holds for our nation, we trust that He still knows what's going on and God asks us to trust Him. And we get to look back at our history we get to look back at Israel's history, and we get to look back at Jesus, who is the most beautiful example of God using evil men to accomplish a beautiful good, where he died on the cross because evil men wanted to kill the greatest man who ever lived. But God came back to life, and he used that death, he used their actions to set us free from our sins, from this world, and to bring us to life everlasting. God also tells us that we will, the righteous will live by faith because we are called to live eternally. We are part of God's eternal kingdom. We are strangers here, foreigners and citizens of a heavenly kingdom. So that means even if difficulty comes, even if we are put to death for our faith, we are punished, if we are suffering, we know that God has not abandoned us because we will be in heaven the same length of time, eternity, it will never end. So if we struggle here, that does not mean that God does not care about us. It means that He has already guaranteed us a beautiful future. And He wants us to come home with Him a little bit earlier. So today, you can ask these questions of God. How long are you going to listen to me? Lord, I'm praying to you and I want you to understand me. I want you to show me what you're trying to get to make happen. How there's good in this. You can ask those questions, but live by faith. Trust the God who has shown you that He loves you. Trust the God who has called you out of this world into His other kingdom so that you can live here, but not put your hope in the here and now, but live here as His light, as His beacon to call other people to Him so that they may have the same peace that you have, knowing that God controls all things and that you have been called to eternal life with Him forever. 
be at peace, knowing that God is patient with you and with this world. But at the appointed time, Jesus, your Savior, will come to judge the living and the dead. And he knows you by name, and he loves you. And at that time, all things will be judged, and you will be with God forever. Live by faith, Christians. Amen. Please stand.